now 6 p.m. And I will officially start this webinar. Sorry uh, for uh, uh, apologize to the audience that you heard a lot of chatter there about technical issues. Um, but, uh, you know, however familiar we think we are with Zoom, there's always one further obstacle to be uh, uh, conquered. Um, I am now officially starting uh, uh, today's webinar uh, and I want to uh, welcome uh, Rochana Mujumdar, who is going to be speaking to us today by first introducing her officially and telling you a little bit about her work, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, but in any case, uh, let me uh, just uh, uh, give you a few further details. So Rochuna Mojumdar is Associate Professor at the Department of South Asian Languages and Civilizations in Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago. She's also the Interim Director of the Nicholson Center for British Studies, University of Chicago, and a member of the University of Chicago's Center for Contemporary Theory. She is a historian of modern India with a focus on Bengal. Her writings span histories of gender and sexuality, Indian cinema, especially art cinema and film music, and modern Indian intellectual history. She also writes on post-colonial history and theory. Rochana started out as a historian of gender and arranged marriage in colonial and post-colonial Bengal that resulted in her book, Marriage and Modernity, Family Values in Colonial Bengal. Her interest in postcoloniality as an intellectual standpoint led to her second work, Writing Postcolonial History, where she analyzed the impact of postcolonial theory on a variety of historical fields. Her interests in the culture and aesthetics of mass democracy led her to study cinema, in particular Indian cinema. Mojumda's work has been supported by the American Institute for Indian Studies and the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation. She has been a visiting scholar at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Emotions, Berlin and IWM Vienna. She also writes, as many of you know, of course, for the Indian Express, Outlook and Ananda Bajar Potrika in Bengali. Her talk today, which is titled The New Indian Cinema Journey of the Art Film, is drawn from her forthcoming book on Indian art cinema, to be published next year from Columbia University Press in 2021. So a very warm welcome to you, uh, Rochana. Uh, 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 thank you very much for being here today after several sort of obstacles and hurdles. You were meant to do this physically with us at the um, center uh, when the pandemic struck and you had to return to the US and it couldn't be done. And then we again, we needed to reschedule it. But finally, you're here. You're here and your audience is here and we are very, very happy to have you with us. You have such a long association with the center uh, that, you know, that's something that I won't, uh, I mean, I'm sure I don't need to actually mention. So uh, welcome to you today and um, please uh, begin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rosinka. I also wanted to thank Topatidi who, uh, who extended the original invitation in March. Am I audible to everybody? Um, I hope yes. I am. Um, yes, we can and, Okay, thank you. And then of course, COVID happened and all our lives changed. But like you said, uh, here we are in a new setup. And I should actually beg your uh, forgiveness at the beginning. I'm trying to admit people um, as I go because I will be showing some clips. I just don't know whether, uh, how well they're going to transmit on Zoom. But let's try. And I actually want to start by, by sharing my screen. There are still people coming. Mm. Okay, so am I now on screen share, uh, Rosinka? Yes, do you, we, can see, do you we can see your screen which says scheduling made easy. Whoops. Yeah. There, there, that's it. That's now, it. With the slideshow now, yeah. Okay, very good. So, so yeah, okay, that's very good. There we are. Um, three films Bhuban Shom by Mrinal Shin, Uski Roti, Money Calls, and Sara Akash by Basu Chatterjee in 1969 signaled the arrival of a new Indian cinema. Sorting through the film historical record, it is hard not to be struck by the pugnacious nature of many of the writings that were occasioned by this so-called New Indian Cinema, or as people often called it, the Indian New Wave. Most of the writing was authored by film directors and um, 
film directors and critics. Sorry, there are still people coming in. So um, it's, like I said, a little distracting. Um, most of the, the, the uh, literature authored by film directors and critics, the intent of much of this writing was either to knock down the idea that there was anything new or movement-like in these films, or to praise them by proclaiming their radical newness. Taken together, I would, I would submit to you that the Indian New Wave and um, not just the films, but the, the, the world of film journalism that burst around it, the kind of cine club writing that uh, took place around it. So taken together, this whole cinematic moment constitutes, um, constitutes a period of unparalleled ferment that had no precedent and nor has it been replicated since in Indian film history. It would be no exaggeration um, it would be no exaggeration to say that uh, Shotarit Rai contributed to this spate and spirit of argumentation. He made the Indian new wave far more contentious than it would have otherwise been. His, however, was not the only skeptical voice about the claims of uh, new cinema, but it was certainly the best known and most influential. In, in his two essays, An Indian New Wave, published in 1971, and Four and a Quarter, published in 1974, Rai questioned if there was anything new in the films gathered under this moniker, New Cinema. The 1971 essay, An Indian New Wave, published in Filmfare, is an exposition on the concept and, con and content of novelty in cinema. The second essay, published in 1974, um, offered a critical analysis of Onkur, uh, or Ankur, Sham Benegal's 1974 film, Garam Hava by Satyu, 1973, Duvidha by Mani Kol, and uh, Maya Darpan by Kumar Shani. So, uh, you know, these are some of the characters, um, some of the characters associated with, uh, with the new cinema movement. And there were many more. There was Patavi Reddy, there was, uh, I showed Adul Gopalakrishnan, and Girish Karnad, later on Girish Kasaravali, John Abraham and so forth. So Ray's Four and a Quarter took on four important films of uh, the Indian new cinema. In, and since then, much ink and, okay, still admitting people, much ink and vitriol was subsequently spilled on proving him wrong. The debate between, uh, between Rai and his detractors have for a long time masked crucial aspects of the new cinema that were indeed novel. Its funding structure, its relationship with literature and to the mainstream film industry. Besides to arrive at any judgment about claims, about the claims of novelty or being new, to understand what constituted newness, we must look closely at the films themselves. And this is the exercise that I want to undertake today by paying close attention in the second half of the talk to one film, Mrinal Shen's Bhubon Shom. The film, as you will, some of you are probably familiar with it. Um, the film, as you know, allegorizes the question of novelty through the confusion experienced by its eponymous protagonist, Bhuvan Shom, a role essay by Utpal Dutto in the film. But first, a few words about uh, Rai and the New Wave. Rai, as I said, was scathing and positively hurtful in the remarks that he made on this film. He dismissed, um, he dismissed that, uh, Actually, overall, in, in Is There an Indian New Wave, the 1971 piece, he dismissed the claim that the Indian new cinema represented anything new. He summed up Bhuvan Shom uh, for, and again, this is, this is very, very, uh, it's, a, it's a famous essay and famous last lines. He said that it looks a bit like its French counterpart, but is essentially old fashioned and Indian beneath its trendy habit. And uh, he then goes on to say that my own opinion is that whatever success it has had is not because, is not because, but in spite of its new aspects. It worked because it used some of the most popular conventions of cinema. 
a delectable heroine, a year-filling background score, and a simple, wholesome, wish-fulfilling screen story. And then came his famous scathing last words that this was a film which could be summed up in the typical Hollywood formula of seven words. It was a big bad bureaucrat reformed by a rustic village bell. This was Ray's failure. He had become a prisoner of his own understanding of newness. Critics, contemporary and recent, have claimed that Ray's 1975 and 1974 articles represented a knee-jerk and conservative dismissal of work by a younger generation, by an established and, uh, and world-renowned filmmaker. I should add here, actually, that uh, Shotajitra and Mrinal Shen, again, it's no news to this audience, they are really contemporaries, but uh, Mrinal Shen was more associated with the Indian New Wave. Uh, I mean, he was making films from the late 50s, very soon after uh, Shotajit Rai, but nonetheless, the, the associations are, or he tends to be associated more with the Indian New Wave, largely because of a manifesto that he authored with Arun Kaul, where he laid out uh, some of the foundations of what the Indian New Wave might be. Many have pointed to the incongruity of Shotajit Rai obliterating the memory of his own difficulties during the making of Pothir Pachali, especially of his urge to break free of established patterns in Indian cinema. His emphasis in the essays on the storytelling function of films and on cinema's ability to communicate with the audience obfuscated his own virtuoso innovations that were constitutive of those functions and could only have resulted from an acute awareness of the materiality of the film medium. In writing, Shotajit Rai sounded unnecessarily antagonistic to the cinematic avant-garde and to modernist experimentation. Readers familiar with his films, however, would be aware of their formal and aesthetic innovations. And they would also be aware that how these innovations contradicted the militantly conservative realist stance he seemed to assume against, um, against the modernist and avant-garde filmmakers. Rai's basic argument was that in Western and Eastern European films, some Japanese cinema and some American films of that period, the younger generation, and I quote him, had veered towards unconventionalism and did so through displays of um, on-screen sex. So much so that fragmentation, I'm still quoting him, a modish cinematic device which chops up a scene or statement has rarely been applied. Sorry, there are still more people waiting to be admitted, okay. Um, so much so that fragmentation, a modish cinematic device that which chops up a scene or statement has rarely been applied to scenes of sexual encounter. It was as if the new crop of filmmakers made their place in the commercially driven world of cinema largely due to gratuitous displays of sex. And he's talking about all kinds of cinema here, not just um, Indian cinema. The implication clearly was that, with very few exceptions, such displays were paraded under the guise of novelty. In non-Indian cinemas, he went on to argue, they did not feel incongruous, as on-screen depictions of sex were in keeping with the new culture of sex, pop songs, violence, and drugs in the West. But this was not true in India, where, he wrote, such permissiveness is still a long way off and the portrayal of on-screen sex was not an option. And yet, he says, the new wave is being talked about and the offbeat film is becoming a reality." Unquote. As an aside, it's worth recalling that Ray could be prudish when it came to portrayals of on-screen sexuality. These comments suggest that, and I keep going in, you know, I keep veering between Ray and Rai, so forgive me, uh, have your pick uh, on however you want to pronounce his name. Uh, these comments suggest that uh, Ray felt that the Indian New Wave was a fad with little organic or no relationship to the society from which it arose. What in his eyes then were the constituents of newness in the so-called new cinema that originated in Hindi films coming out of Bombay? He sums it up 
or he sums up the average Hindi film as an amalgam of, and I quote, color, Eastman preferred, songs, six or seven, invoices, one thousand trusts, dance, solo and ensemble, the more frenzied, the better, bad girl, good girl, bad guy, bad, good guy, romance, but no kisses, guffers, tears, fights, chases, melodrama, characters who exist in a social vacuum, dwellings which do not exist outside of the studio floor, locations in Kulu, Manali, Uti, Kashmir, London, Paris, Hong Kong, Tokyo, any film that left out even even one of the above would be regarded as offbeat, unquote. By this understanding, he concluded, films such as Anand and Mera Nam Joker were also offbeat. Having thus illustrated the idea of the offbeat, he goes on to ask, quote, surely this is a far cry from the offbeat in the European sense, unquote. Given Indian censorship rules and the local audience's expectations of cinema, was, he goes on to write, ask, an avant-garde in the European sense, a viable proposition in India, unquote. Without money, exhibition outlets, and permissive sex, Indian filmmakers would have to, quote, toe the puritanical, hypocritical line and not depend wholly on normal channels of distribution and exhibition, unquote. Having erected an analytical schema that dismissed new experimentation by placing non-negotiable limits on their conditions of possibility, Shrutajit Rai moves swiftly to dismantle claims of novelty in films such as Bhuban Shom, Uski Roti, Dubidha, and My Other Fun. The new wave in India was old cinema masquerading as, uh, masquerading as new. It camouflaged some quintessentially conventional traits under the veneer. Um, sorry, more people. Uh, under some, um, forgive me. So the new, new, new wave in India was the old cinema masquerading as new. It camouflaged some essentially quintessential, it camouflaged some quint quintessentially conventional traits under the veneer of shallow experimentation. Actors with star power, background score, stories that were reminiscent of Indian folk tales or other wish-fulfilling narratives. Bhuvan Shom, widely regarded as the first or as among the first of, uh, in Indian new cinema, elicited thus the scathing remarks from Ray that you see on screen. Now Ray's articles evoked a variety of reactions. If some respectfully disagreed with him, Others discussed new cinema more generally without naming him. Readers, especially in the close-knit world of film societies and film magazines, would not have no difficulty in seeing that they were written to, to refute Ray. Finally, people who were opposed to state support in a crusade against public spending on cinema uh, instrumentalized his remarks to strengthen that crusade. So you need to, you know, if you look at the pages of screen and film fair in those days, you'll actually find uh, some very, uh, some weird, you know, some unholy alliances, if you will. I mean, the way that Ray gets instrumentalized by a bunch of people who, who sort of erect him or use his name or hide behind uh, his name to launch a crusade against uh, more experimental filmmakers. So I'm just going to briefly touch on a few examples from each of the samples of opposition towards Ray. I should underscore that the category that Ray used, new cinema, was replaced by a variety of names, all referencing the same body of works in the four years that passed between Ray's two essays. Between 71 and 74, you have a plethora of names that arose fast and loose in the Indian film world. So the names would be New cinema, parallel cinema, counter cinema, political cinema, alternative cinema, personal cinema, state cinema, avant-garde, experimental cinema, middle cinema, unpopular cinema, and so forth. Okay. Now, um, and, and like I said, that they signaled a ferment in the Indian film world in terms of the polemics they generated, the involvement of the state, and the creation of a small but significant public engaged in cinematic discourse. 
Such a public in evidence in numerous seminars, journal issues, film society discussion fora was without precedent in Indian film history. In, in, so uh, let me start with Bikram Singh, a film journalist who registered the extraordinariness of the level of discussion around cinema when he wrote in 1973, quote, the most heartening thing is that the new parallel counter, call them what you will, films are being discussed with the kind of seriousness and enthusiasm which Indian cinema has perhaps never before received, unquote. Chidanandu Dashkupto, the well-known critic noted, quote, the low budget, realistic, artistically advanced body of films has been defined under a multiplicity of rubrics, alternative cinema, new cinema, parallel cinema, art cinema, other cinema, personal cinema, auteur cinema, and so on, unquote. Dashkupto's preferred name was unpopular cinema distinguishing this body of films from the commercial popular cinema. One of the earliest uses of the name new cinema, as I said, uh, in India was in a manifesto written in 1968 by Minal Shin and Arun Kaul, who was a film society activist, screenwriter and critic. Invoking such widely divergent film practices as the French New Wave and the American Underground uh, films as their inspirations, Call and Shen wrote, quote, new cinema stands for a film with a signature. It engages itself in a ruthless search for truth as an individual artist sees it, lays stress on the right questions, believes in looking fresh at everything, including old values and in probing deeper everything, including the mind and conditions of man. In 1970, the expression parallel came into use after the Hindi word Samantar, used by a journalist Arvind, Arvind Mehta in the journal Madhuri. And then it was picked up by the English Daily Times of India. Now, Rai's articles were probably a response to the loftiness expressed on new cinema's behalf by filmmakers and critics like uh, Kaul and Shen. He was also fiercely criti criticized by two young film directors, Mani Kaul and Kumar Shani. Um, for them, his attitudes were symptomatic of underdeveloped countries where, quote, it is not uncommon to see insecurity coupled with authoritarianism that stifles all new changes and all attempts at developments. Contrary, to, uh, contemporary writings also illustrate by the mid 70s, um, by the mid, uh, illustrate that um, by the mid 70s, there was sharp divisions between the mainstream film industry and the small group of filmmakers associated with the new wave. Dilip Padgankar, then a young assistant director with The Times of India, while critical of, of Shotujit Rai, registered an ambiguity on whether or, or on what the new or parallel cinema was. He wrote, those handful of directors flagged as the parallel stream did not start a novel trend in filmmaking, let alone a movement along the lines of the Eastern European or Latin American cinemas in the mid 60s. Now, Chidananda Dashkupta, who I mentioned earlier, argued that the distinction between art and commercial cinema was necessary in India because Indian commercial cinema never achieved such heights of universalized art as Hollywood figures such as Hitchcock, Hawks, Chaplin, Ford. The new cinema, he argued, is the creation of an intellectual elite that is keenly aware of the human condition in India. Not all of its protagonists are exercised equally over problems of poverty, but there is a basic awareness of these factors, even among those who do not construct their films around them. The new cinema expiates modern India's sense of guilt over its own persistent legacy of privilege. This gives it a purpose. Now, one could basically summarize the, the, the opposition to Ray, uh, both in contemporary writings and in writings that have uh, uh, come out since then in, these, in two streams. So in one view, there are critics like Dash Kupto, Iqbal Masood, Aruna Vasudev, Satish Bahadur, who trace new cinema's antecedents back to Shotojit Rai and the success of Pothir Pachali. The other narrative coming out of an emerging film studies scholarship 
particularly from the mid 80s around the Journal of Arts and Ideas, staunchly distanced the new wave phenomenon from Shuktajit Rai. Madhav Prasad, in broad agreement with, uh, with scholars like Ashish Rajat Yaksha, made an important distinction between the different strands of new cinema. A cinema with a developmental and statist agendas, agenda, like Sham Benegal's films, a middle class cinema, Basu Chatterjee, Basu Bhattacharya, and so on, and regional cinemas of Kerala, Karnataka, Pattabi Ramareddy, Girish Karnad, Adul Gopalakrishnan, and so on, and the avant garde. Manikol and Kumashani. In Prasad's fine analysis, new cinema's demise occurred when the energies of the developmental and middle class films were absorbed by the mainstream film industry. Recently, some scholars, among them most notably Aparna Frank, have gone on to further separate out Manikol and Kumashani from a superficially classed group of new wave filmmakers, her words whilst noting that most historians of new wave cinema acknowledge the limitations of the phrase new wave, Frank argues uh, that Shani and Kohl uh, have to be placed in the history of aesthetic modernism in India, whose counterparts are to be found in painting and documentary in such artists as Akbar Padamsi, M.F. Hussain, SNS Shastri, Pramod Pati, and others. Now, in this histori historiographical, film historiographical minefield, it still leaves us with the question with which I started. How do we grasp newness of the new cinema? Now, without reducing the heterogeneity of the new cinema to the efforts of a single, uh, single institution or individual, there is no gain saying that the Film Finance Corporation, especially in the 1960s, played an important if controversial role in the birth of the new cinema, especially in the tenure of its charismatic chairman, B.K. Karanjia. However, government funding alone did not qualify films as the new cinema. Sham Benegal's Ankur, for example, is an important exception. Aside from funding, <clears throat> there was another crucial feature that is crucial. Uh, there, there is another feature that is crucial for considerations of newness in new cinema in India. It's alliance with literature. Now this has gone largely unremarked in an otherwise uh, detailed film historiographical scholarship. Questions of adaptation between literature and cinema, as well as writers' attitudes towards experimentation and formalism were very much a part of the new cinema discourse. Until then, until the 60s, only well-known filmmakers like Shotaljit Rai or critics such as writers or cinephile or critics like Osho Krudro, Nirat Choudhury had been known to engage in passionate and lengthy polemics around questions of adaptation. It was relatively rare to find writers engaged in questions of cinema. The new cinema changed that. A large number of new cinema were based on works by new authors. Those made in Hindi drew upon authors associated with Naik Kahani. In Bangla, a new generation of authors, including people who would later go on to become uh, significant names of the Bengali literary establishment, like Shunil Ganguly. In Kannada, modernist authors like you are Anantamurti. Just as writers in different Indian languages, Nai Kahani in Hindi, Nai Afsane in Urdu, Nafia in Kannada, and Chidukottai in Tamil, there was uh, the hungry generation poets in Bangla and those associated with journals like Puricha and Utun Shahito, the last literally, as you know, meaning new literature, uh, who regarded themselves as a literary avant-garde and revolted against the older generation, so too did many new cinema makers disavow the works of the previous generation. So if Mrinal Shen, Manikol, Kumar Shani spoke about a complete break with the past, others like Sham Benegal and Adur Gopalakrishnan had no problems in explicitly acknowledging the influence in their work of forebears like Shotajit Rai. So far, I've given you a detailed or somewhat detailed historical account, perhaps even a developmental account of the new Indian cinema. Now I want to make a slight detour and argue with special reference to Mrinal Shen's Bhuvan Shom that the claim of being new does not have to connote time as a progressive continuum 
that usually underpins an exhaustive narrative of development of Indian cinema. So, you know, from Pothir Pachali to uh, the 60s, the break uh, represented by uh, these films, Kumar Shani Mani called, so it's a kind of, it doesn't have to be like a march forward. Claims of newness could be about the act of breaking out of the structures of the everyday and thus experiencing the time of the present as non-continuous in its relationship to the past and to the future. That is as fissured. A fissured present is a present of multiple possibilities, many of them only glimpsed and barely lived. Implicit, so I'm going to underscore the barely glimpsed and, and barely lived only glimpsed and barely lived. Implicit in the debate on newness in Indian cinema thus was a debate about the nature of historical time, continuous or not. Bhuvan Shom surpassed its, own, its makers, Mrinal Shen's own expectations of it in terms of the success it garnered. I want to touch, touch on, on, on a few aspects of it, in particular to underscore what the aesthetic of newness felt like. Bhuvan Shom, writes Madhav Prasad, made realism a national political project. But it, this was not the humanist realism of Shrutajit Rai, with its aura of individual artistic achievement, with accents of Ari Cartier-Bresson and Jean Renoir, but a radical realist practice that used the comic mode to critically comment on or even subvert realism. In Prasad's analysis, Bhuvan Shom, the name of the character, the eponymous hero of the film, Bhuvan Shom's transformation following his encounter during the bird shooting holiday with a charming village girl, Gauri, from an irascible, these are just some, some stills of the film's personnel, I'll come to, I'll come to them in a second. Um, whoops. So, from an irascible hidebound state functionary to someone who is more understanding of the realities of everyday life that made petty bribes not appear like grievous acts of criminality remains the most radical element in sense film. Interestingly, Chotajit Rai also had focused on this theme of transformation, albeit in less complementary terms. Recall his seven word summary of the film, Big Bad Bureaucrat uh, uh, Reformed by Rustic Village Bell or rustic bell. To focus on the transformation while not wrong, misses out on the work of detail in the film. Bhuvan Shom, as Mrinal Shen once noted, was about mapping an open-ended journey of what happens to a person when he leaves the famil his familiar surroundings for utterly unknown settings. The film's depiction of experiences that ensue during this encounter with the unknown contributed to the lasting freshness of Bhuvan Shom. It is to one of those elements in the film that I will, that I want to focus in the time that I have remaining. But first, some background. Bhuvan Shom was based on a story of the same name by Bonapul, Balai Chand Mukhopadhyay. Mrinal Shen read it in a magazine called Shachitra Bharat in 1956 and contacted its author, who was a medical do doctor by profession and who had spent most of his uh, uh, adult professional life uh, in the Hindi speaking region of Bhagalpur in the state of then state of Bihar expressing his interest in making it into a film. It was difficult to secure a loan to make the film with one financier agreeing to make an advance provided Shom Shaib was made younger so that some kind of relationship with the girl was possible. This is what Miran Shen writes. Finally the FFC approved a loan based on a draft script some six or seven pages long. In an extended conversation about the film, Mrinal Shen said, shared his thoughts on why it marked a break in Indian cinema. There is the humorous tone in the film, inspired nonsense is how uh, Mrinal Shen described it, citing Jacques Tati. Much of it explore, uh, accomplished by the use of animation, sound effects, freezes, mask shots, and a creative background score. The numerous freeze frames in Bhuvan Shom are quite different, and I'll show you one in a second, are quite different from the use of this device in Charulata or in the revolutionary films from Latin America, such as uh, Solana Sanjitino's Hour of the Furnaces or Memories of Underdevelopment. 
for they generate a feeling of play. The use of, uh, the use of animation too was novel in Indian cinema. Ram Mohan, an animation expert uh, based in Bombay, so I just wanted to go back to the slides of the personnel associated with the film. Um, so Ram Mohan was an animation expert uh, based in Bombay, KK Mahajan, a graduate of the Film Institute who became the film cinematographer and for many new cinema films hereafter. Sadhu Meher, who played the role of Gauri's husband and served as uh, Sen's production assistant. Vijay Raghav Rao, the music director then employed by the film's division, and of course, Suhasini Mule, they were all new entrants into the world of professional Hindi cinema. And their iconoclasm shone through the film. The film was also a Hindi debut for Upal Dotto, the renowned theater and Bangla film actor who played its titular role. The humorous tone is, is quite early when the protagonist is introduced through the voiceover of Amitabh Bachchan, another newcomer who would go on to become Indian cinema superstar. As it tells us that Shom is an honest and upright officer in the Indian railways, we see anim a succession of animated images of heaps of ill-arranged files, a pen signing uh, rapidly without a pause, a set of swing doors with Sri Bhuvan Shom, scrawled in uneven letters, as was usual in nameplates in government offices, and a telephone ringing incessantly. Now I'm giving you all of this verbal description because I'm not sure how well this is going to transmit in Zoom, but let me play it. It'll stagger a bit, but let's recall that this was near cinema and the soundtrack was jagged even, even in the films. But here we go. This is from the from, near the opening sequence. Um, not quite the opening sequence, but close to it. So you hear Amita Bangal. Shonar Bangal. Mahan Bangal. And uh, Rosinka, did it transmit properly or were there, was it too staggered? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. It went surprisingly well. Uh, it, okay. it actually came okay. In that well. case, let me just play the next clip. And, uh, and here you'll actually see uh, the work of animation um, in the next clip. Um, so here we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so good <laughs> According to Parag Almadi, these innovations in Bhuvan Shom have to be seen in line with ongoing experiments in the documentary making unit of the government of India, uh, the film's division. 
documentary filmmakers like Subdev, Pramod Pati, K, uh, K. S. Chari, S. N. S. Shastri, and N. V. K. Muthi attempted to integrate the formal approach of Western experimental and independent cinema, as well as the creative uh, atmosphere of the National Film Board of Canada. Rinal Shen himself contributed to the FD endeavor um, uh, called Know Your Country. Bhuvan Shom bore the stamp of an institutionalized movement that included the Film Finance Corporation, the Films Division, and especially, as you saw, the, latest, uh, the latter's animation unit. Underlying the humor, however, is a, is a complex take on the contemporary. Bhuvan Shom's oddities are attributed to his being a Bengali. The late 60s were a period when critiques of the Bengali Bhadralok constituted a dominant strand of Bengali history and politics. Middle-class Bengalis, of which Shane himself was a member, engaged in an autocritic, whereby the dismal plight of Bengali youth, industrial backwardness, widespread unemployment, etc., was attributed to the deep-seated comprador sensibilities or characteristics of, this, of that class. Bengalis were seen as classic mimic men, subservient and fawning of their British overlords. Yet this was the same class that produced a panoply of talents. And you saw that panoply, you know, from Vidakananda to Shwetaji Thrai. Sen's characterization of Bengali history and heritage during the early scenes that introduced Bhuban Shom to the audience lays out this dense history in a highly dense but tongue-in-cheek fashion. As, as you saw, there were this series of shots and the voiceover, Bangal, it said, Shonar Bangal, Vichitra Bangal. The Bangal highlighting a non-Bengali speaker's locution, melting into a melee of voices chanting the revolutionary slogan in Kalab Zindabad. That in turn dissolves into complete silence, followed by another anonymous angry male voice threatening to go on strike if certain demands by cinema workers were not met. These images were accompanied by, by the stills of uh, Bivetananda Tagore, uh, Shotojit Rai, Ravi Shankar, and so on. And this, the parade of illustrious Bigolis then dissolved into shots of processions, police firings, the poster of Ho Chi Minh, there's actually an effigy of, uh, of Johnson, Bengali women marching in the streets, ending with the shot of the poster from An Evening in Paris, Shokti Shamantas, 1967 film. Bhuvan Shom is the bearer of this heritage and its myriad contradictions. Mrina Shen's outlook on Bengali history sets him apart in his times when fewer artists and intellectuals had much patience for the achievements of the social group and emphasized more its shortcomings. The rest of the film is actually about the fate of such an individual, a Bengali, a Bengali Bhadralok individual, when he finds himself in the unfamiliar surroundings where he's the boss of no one, including himself. Let me now turn and I'll conclude with this to a brief spell in the film that is at odds with the rest of its humorous narrative. Shom has something of an epiphany. And again, I'm going to describe the sequence, uh, you know, at, at some length before I play it. Shom has something of an epiphany during this sequence that has a strange dreamlike fabulous quality. Interestingly, this sequence was Mrinal Shen's imp improvisation and is absent in Bono Poole's original story. Gauri, uh, dresses up Shom as a Western Indian villager in a short kurta, churidar, and a big turban and a stick, sufficiently scruffy so as not to alert the birds that were there, that, uh, that there was a stranger in their midst. He was having a very hard time bird spotting, so she says, I'm gonna dress you up so that birds actually mistake you for a villager. They will then head over, you'll see, to a haunted Bhut Bangla, she tells him, as that was the best site from which to spot birds. We see the two figures in a long shot, Gauri and Shom, running on a dazzling empty expanse of rocky sand with his gun effortlessly perched on his shoulder. On her shoulder, I beg your pardon. Shom's voice quizzically inquires where she's taking him, as there is a cut into a darker shadowy space with, in a ram with a ramshackle house in the background. 
Gauri and Shom appear in the foreground, their backs to us, as they make their way nimbly towards the building. We hear their excited voices against the sound of the wind blowing in the empty landscape. Once they're inside the building, the sound of the wind is punctuated by a musical bird call. As the two entered the room, Shom asks, asks Gauri about the whereabouts of the place. It belongs to a king. It used to belong to a king, she tells him, but was now an abandoned house that was haunted. Fantastic, mutters Shom in English, completely transfixed by the strange beauty of his surroundings as Gauri launches into a tale she has heard from her father about kings and queens escaping the heat um, and the queen, uh, the king falling, you know, the queen on her, on her uh, swing and you'll see the swing sequence and I think it will be reminiscent for a lot of you of Charu Lata. And, uh, and then, you know, we'll talk about the contrast between Charu and the Immaculate Gauri. But here you are with the scene and please pay attention to, to its strange dreamlike fabulous quality. This is a slightly long clip, um, but I think it's, it's worth it. suggests Chalo Tili ke upar chalte hai, uh, that they go to a sand dune close by. But with that, the magic spell of the four minute long sequence is broken. 
And we return to Shom's hunting quest in the rest of the narrative. Mrinal Sen uh, described the shooting of this sequence as something that was decided on location. The brother of the Raja of Bhavnagar, the place in Saurashtra and Gujarat where they were filming, told them about a spot where flamingos came to feed around noon. Then they flew off to a lake about four kilometers away. During filming, there were so many birds that Mahajan, the cinematographer, said, I cannot see anything. As for the house, Utpal Dotto cited it when the film crew was making its way to the dunes. A small house with a veranda, the sea where the birds landed. The housekeeper, Chauki Dar, uh, narrated the, the, the story about the king and queen about that Gauri told Shom. This is exactly how I arranged the shots between Utpal and Suhashini. A moment of perfect beauty that so unsettles the obstinate bureaucrat that when he returns to his regular job, he makes an uncharacteristic judgment by rewarding a petty thieving functionary. Images of his hunting holiday, Gauri's face, her laughter flash in his mind when Shom decides to promote Jadav Patel instead of punishing him. But the tone of the last scenes is once again comedic. The moment I played for you in the bungalow was a brief respite in a comedy that often hits notes of sarcasm. When asked about Bhuban Shom's reception among European audiences as his most erotic film, Mina Sen strenuously downplayed it. He said those were not my primary objective. He writes, there was a complexity in Bhuban Shom's character and temperament and I tried to foreground that element. He was a widower and a moralist. He stared at women and yet almost immediately averted his gaze. In the bird hunting scene, where Suhashini puts her hand gently on Shomshayib's shoulders, he shivers and steals a glance at her. While we were shooting, Suhashini inquired about the relationship being just a father-daughter one. Was it perhaps more than that? I would like to say that this element was only superficial and that it had no bearing on the real issues that I tried to address in the film." Unquote. His disclaimer of any trace of sexuality in the Shom Gauri relationship might appear quaint and anachronistic against the backdrop of the global radical politics of the 1960s, which Sen otherwise uh, espoused. But it is not quaint when we analyze it through the lens of a strand of Indian nationalism, the Gandhian kind. As Leela Gandhi, Ashish Nandi, and others have shown in a milieu where orthodox Indian nationalism was countering imperial allegations of effeminacy through hysterical recuperations of a lost Indian manhood, Gandhi and Ahimsa was predicated on a rigorous refusal of a heteronormative masculinity, Western or Eastern. Contrary to Ray's complaints against censorship in India, both men, Shotarit Rai and Brinal Shen, were legacies of an ethic of sexuality that was premised on an acknowledgement of eroticism, but a denial of sex. Bhuban Shom's arrogant, lonely, and sad ways were irrevocably shaken by his erotic encounter with another India during the bird hunting adventure, and Gauri was its catalyst. Questions about the purported newness of the disciplines and arts have a long history in India, starting perhaps with the Navya intellectuals in, this, in the 17th century that Sheldon Pollock and others have written about. Or maybe it goes even further back, Tazagui, that uh, the idiom of freshness in Indo-Persian poetry that Rajiv Kira has written about. Comparisons with other new waves, the question of influence reminds us of Benedict Anderson's discussion in the revised version of Imagined Communities of new world places such as New Zealand, New London, New Orleans, and so on. The erotic epiphany of the sequence I described in Bhuvan Shom is the engine of the radical democratic possibilities that we can read into the film. The trope of a city ban cut loose of rigid urban regulation in the countryside, proximate with a beautiful, lively young woman is repetitive enough in Indian cinema to confound judgment as it did for Ray. So think about films like Kashmir Ki Kali, et cetera. Now, as, as Deepesh Chakraborty reminds us in his reading of Gilles Deleuze in an essay entitled Belatedness as Possibility, 
Newness enters the world through acts of displacement and disguise. It confounds judgment by making it hard for us to distinguish the new from a simulacrum, a fake that is neither a copy nor an original. There is enough in Bhuvan Shom that make it possible for us to historicize its many stylistic and narrative elements as I tried to do in, in some of what I presented. But these explanations fall short when we analyze the moment of the aesthetic opening that I described in the haunted house scene. Echoing Rinal Sen, I would submit that we miss the film's newness through a conventional viewing in which the wish that a bad man will turn good in the end comes true. We also reduce it when we see it as a saga of a colonial era bureaucrat embracing the post-colonial nation through his forgiving of petty infractions of a subordinate. Bhuvan Shom is new because it is a challenge to moral, political, and aesthetic judgment. It resists ad infinitum, a positive definition of newness, while inciting the critic to always debate what was new or what is new in the new cinema. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ruchana. Um, I'm sure um, many of uh, the people present here today have uh, uh, questions and we will now open it up to the audience. Um, do you want to make me host now so that I can sort of regulate the yes. question and answer session? Then we'll so, proceed from there. Not that, yeah. So how, how so does the, that happen again? The three little dots, the three little yes. dots next to uh, my name, maybe, or your name. Done. Done. Yeah. Is it done? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Um, yeah. Not that. Yeah. Maybe it actually won't make much of a difference at all because I, after all, now there won't be people coming in. But just to you know, uh, introduce the uh, people who uh, wish to ask questions. Um, I myself found that a sort of um, fascinating um, insight. So it did both things, you know, it was sort of divided into two halves. And in the one half, you gave us the, the, the context, if I can sort of put it simplistically. Um, you yourself said in a developmental sort of way, sort of, you know, this is what was happening at that time. And then from, from the larger background and the larger history of that moment, uh, you sort of zoomed in uh, uh, into Bhuvan Shom itself. Um, I will, can I start with a couple of comments, reflections, and then sort of open it up to abuse the position of the chair. I've often found that if I wait for everybody else, I in, end, end up with, you know, uh, 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 no time at all to say anything. I, I was, so, 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 so three things very quickly. So, and we'll collect if it comes to that, I'll ask, I'll ask if there are lots of other questions, then I don't want to deprive you of, you know, um, uh, uh, your time for response. So we'll, we'll collect if there are many other questions coming up uh, right behind this. So one was, of course, uh, predictably, as you would expect, you know, uh, um, what you were saying about um, this new Indian cinema's alliance with literature. And, and of course, uh, that might seem to be the obvious sort of entry point from where I, I, I would want to ask a question, but I wanted to actually pick up not so much on what you were saying about how uh, this cinema's alliance with literature, that it was based on, you know, new writers' works on, on Naika Hani and uh, uh, all of that. Uh, rather than that, I'd like to shift rather to not, not so much to the literary works that they base their works on, but to the issue of what I've called in my own work, the issue of impact and influence. Because when you quoted Shotujit Rai uh, saying in 1971 that it looks a bit like its French counterpart, uh, he was basically echoing something that had been said about, say, for instance, Bangla poetry, which I have worked on since the 1870s. That 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 this is um, this has this is taking too much from English literary convention. 
except in the case of Michael, who managed to break through uh, that that uh, you know with his uh, with his innovations. Most other poets of that time, so say the Mrinal Shens of the poetry world in, in Bengali at that time, like Hem Chandru and Nobin Chandru and other famous poets in their time, but, but not so well known now, were accused exactly of this, you know. Uh, and Parthomitra, as you know, in uh, The Triumph of Modernism has also said that, that when, when Picasso does it, of course, it's, you know, a very, all very innovative. But when, when our artists do it, then it's all impact and influence. So, so one was how to unpack that you know, uh, 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 that trope as it as it existed in Shottujit Rai's own reading of the of the of the situation, because really Rai, uh, Shottujit Rai is the last person one expects to be thinking along those along those lines. So that that was one. The other is also to do the second question is also to do with Shottujit Rai, because what I wanted you to reflect a little bit on is outside the purview of this particular paper, but in the larger context, you see Shottujit Rai himself then went on to make Shotgut. He made Shadgoti in 1981, and basically one could say that he just made a facsimile of this new wave cinema by making this film on, on an untouchable named uh, Dukhi. And, you know, the pro it was more or less, it was like an imitation of, of, I mean, in my reading, and I'm not a film scholar, it's a general layman's reading, let's say. So if you could you, if you could sort of, you know, just take it beyond the time frame that you're looking at. And because you began with Ray and you spent so much time on discussing Ray, and just to reflect then a little bit on what happens to Ray himself after that. Because I think Ray loses himself. I think Ray forgets what it is that he does best and becomes, wants to be, you know, make films like Venegal. That is my, so I'm being provocative, but I, I just wanted you to reflect a little bit on Sadgati because Sadgati seems so much like a new wave or new Indian cinema, or whatever it is. And the last thing, and, and this is really the last thing I'll, is you spoke about film studies scholarship, you spoke about Madhav's work and of course Ashish and all of that. Um, I was wondering whether you could say a little bit or reflect a little bit uh, on the role of the FTII. Because I was uh, in Pune, you know, from, so this is again bringing in my own personal experience into this, but I was in Pune from 86 to 90. And I, I was in the Film Institute almost every day in the evenings to watch one of the, one of the films. And, and, and basically because I had a cousin who was doing direction there. But this is the thing, the idealization of Manikol and Kumar Shani. The, 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 the stories about Riti Ghatok in Pune, in the film studies department, how exactly was uh, pedagogy in the Film and Television Institute in Pune responsible in some sense in setting up the structures and parameters that May, that that informed the way in which we read new Indian uh, cinema now, you know, because I think FTI has a sort of crucial role to play. Uh -huh. So I leave it there. That's too many questions from me already. Um, and I will now ask whether other people have a question or whether you want to just, it. I'm sorry, I asked three at the same time. Do you want to yeah. collect or do you want to? Shall I respond to your questions very yeah. quickly? And then sure. open up. they're great questions. And you know, in some ways, I hope, um, I'll give you provisional answers now, but I hope that you'll find more detailed answers in, in my book, which uh, will be out next year. Because, um, you know, one of the things that I do in the book is actually give a history of art cinema, uh, beginning in the 50s and ending sometime in the early 80s. And the three foundational, it's three foundational figures, uh, Rai Ghatok and Shen, uh, are the subjects of the second part of the book. So going to your first question, the, you know, the one way of telling the new cinema story is to do exactly what you were gesturing towards, to say that, oh, look, this has happened. This, a similar kind of debate has taken place in, in literature. Similar debates have taken place in, in painting and so on. And you, one could reproduce the realism versus modernism debate which actually my colleague uh, David Roderick actually wrote his Crisis of Political Modernism book, where he says that, you know, that debate at one point just reaches a stalemate. And of course, you know, we've, we've all, it's a global debate and I think everyone's felt uh, its impact. And that's one of the reasons why I, I mean, it's, and it's also important to understand where new cinema is coming from, but it doesn't exhaust the entirety of all that there is to understand about new cinema, you know, to, 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 to think about it in terms of 
either the Indian history of realism and uh, realism versus modernism in, in all in various media or to, you know, then kind of, uh, or it's not even an either or proposition, but to say that, oh, this is how these, you know, this is how global debates are in dialogue with whatever the Indian debates are. So I was actually, while acknowledging those debates, I was also trying to move into a different direction where I was taking the, the film seriously and looking to see how we might I mean, and that's why I said the film allegorizes the bewilderment felt by its eponymous hero. So, you know, that, that experience of what newness feels like. So that's one of the things that I was trying to, to present to you. I mean, both in terms of formal strategy, but also at the level of affect. So that's the first thing. The second is, uh, is about Rai and Shodgoti. You know, one thing that, uh, at least the Journal of Arts and Ideas crowd in the early days didn't take sufficient note of was how much experimentation Shotojit Rai himself was undertaking at this very period. Uh, in fact, you know, Shupriya Choudhury has a very beautiful article called In the City where she writes about Ray's City films. I write about Ray's City trilogy in, in my book also, Protitundi, Shimabadth, and John Oruno. Uh, where in his, in his language, you know, he was using a bunch of gimmicks. I mean, as Chidananda Dashgupta once said that, you know, in, in Pratidondi, Shotajit Rai illustrates that when it comes to gimmicks, he's, he's about as strong as, as strong as anyone else. And, um, and then in a later essay in the, in, written in the 80s, he softens his tone, Shotajit Rai. And, you know, he says that, look, there was, there was something going on formally in that moment. I think what he did not like in, in the late 60s, early 70s was, was basically being categorized as somebody who belonged to the past of Indian new cinema. You know, he, he, he was himself undertaking all of this experiment. And it's interesting that he and Ghotok and Shen are confreres. And I mean, thankfully, we don't have to inherit their biases and their fights. But as you know, all too well, there were... There were all these camps. And I think that some of the, the militancy that you see in Rai is a reflection also of being a very engaged participant in this really divided, acrimonious, uh, pugilistic atmosphere of uh, not just Bengal, but you know, like alternative cinema circuits within, within India uh, or an all India scene. The third question about FTII is super interesting. Sorry, you muted yourself again. Yeah, sorry. Before you, uh, just to, because you mentioned Ray, Ghotok and Shen so many times and I'm not a film study scholar. So Topon Sinha is not part of the, so I had heard somebody or somewhere, some uh, Bengali film critics saying uh, uh, Bangla cinema chatte chaka. Uh, 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 um, uh, Ra uh, Ray Ghatok Shen and Tapun uh, Sinha, to which apparently Dhruva Gupta had responded uh, saying, Chatte Chaka Kintu Shoman Noy. So, so. When you say, yeah, so it's the three. I, they are the I've three. I've chosen the three figures because. Uh, but it, because they are widely acknowledged as the foundational figures of Bangla cinema. Uh, there are, That's there what are I'm many asking. people who are coming up now. Again, the influence that each of these men exercise, not just within Bengal, but going to the FTII question, as you know, Kodok was the vice principal for just one year. But even in that one year, the kind of impact that he had, and not just on future filmmakers, but cinematographers, sound engineers, technicians, it's incredible. Mina Shen was the only person in this lot. I mean, Chotojit made Shatsaranj Ki Khilari, but Mina Shen was the only person who made films in multiple Indian languages. So if you track, and I've written about this, you know, I've written about film societies, if you track the kind of uh, traffic in film societies, it is incredible to see the, the impact and influence that these three people evoked. And actually nobody else 
in in Bangla cinema exercises that kind of influence. That's that's really the reason why I've chosen them. I mean, I'm a huge fan of you know Torun Majumdar, Topun Shingho. There are many people, and again, I don't. I personally have no investment in these rankings. As a historian, I'm actually documenting what was going on in the scene. But ending with FDII, uh, all these people were at the FDII. Paul Shahani, Gopala Krishnan, John Abraham, uh, John Abraham, yeah, John Abraham, uh, Syed Mirza. It's an incredible group of people. Vidhu Vinod Chopra also was there. Mm-hmm. You know, then Shane Vidhu Yaro. Uh, so FDI is a very important uh, place, and and I think, and you know, again, you can't mention uh, Film and Television Institute of India and the National Film Archives without invoking P K Nair, yeah. who was. I mean, who was an, it, incredibly impactful. So, of course, without all of these institutional structures, which is, which is why even in a potted kind of uh, way, I tried to emphasize the importance of institutions because the history I write is also cognizant of the role that these institutions played. So, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much. So I believe Moidul has a question. And in case I don't see anyone, just type it into chat and I'll uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, invite you in. So Moidul, if you can unmute yourself and just ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rajinkadi. Uh, thank you, Rajinkadi, for a, a very fascinating uh, uh, lecture. And uh, I really liked it in terms of uh, how you deal with the uh, uh, subject and also uh, uh, the wider canvas that, that, you, uh, that you put it. Uh, I have actually two clarifications, not just a question. Uh, so one is that in the earlier part of your lecture, you pointed about this uh, guilt of the intellectual class who is kind of introspecting and in terms of how Miral Sen did that uh, in Bhuvan Shom. Uh, and it's something to do with, with, uh, with how he uh, grapples with the subject. Uh, and I'm, I quite agree with that, that how, how uh, Sain actually uh, uh, quite programmatically uh, does so in most of his films, uh, which is propagandist, but at the same time, questioning the middle class from where he belongs. And, and here also is a bureaucrat, Bhubon Shom, where he also questions the, the uh, you know, the kind of disciplinary tyranny that, that uh, the colonial bureaucrat uh, is, is uh, quite uh, symbolizing. Uh, now, this introspection of, of the intellectual class is also a kind of a constant uh, uh, thing, even in later films, not only by Sen, but also uh, from other directors. Uh, I, can, I can remember Party in 1984 by Govind Nihalani, where precisely the intellectuals are coming together and they are kind of introspecting that, look, you know, we do theory, we discuss everything, but you see someone who is out there in the field uh, working with Adivasis and you know, their displacement question. You know, the, so so the, the, essence, the essence is that of practice. So, so I, I think this is where I'm trying to um, provoke you, is that uh, are you suggesting that this journey of the new Indian wave cinema is essentially also a journey of uh, self-critique uh, and uh, is is it is it where where are you uh, are you putting your thesis in? This is something which which I'm trying to uh, provoke you. And because this journey seems to be uh, starting from late '60s, although I have a very different position. My position is that actually there is nothing called a new wave cinema. It's just uh, what you call unpopular or parallel cinema. And I, I think Ray's trilogy is something which can be also seen as a parallel cinema, which is unpopular cinema uh, coming from me, right from mid 1950s. Uh, uh, but also th- that's a, that's a very different uh, d- different debate. I don't want to uh, p- uh, you know uh, provoke that here. So this is somewhere I- I'm trying to understand uh, the introspection of the intellectual class is where where are you suggesting? This is number one, and my second clarification is that uh, at uh, the last part of your lecture, there was uh, this uh, utterance of the word that you you talked about radical democratic possibilities, uh, which which is uh, which you find in in the cinema of Sen or maybe in Bhuvan Show. So, if you can elaborate on on that, thank you. Okay, Rochuna, 
Um, there are actually two others uh, who have uh, indicated in chat that they want to ask. Do you want to take it together or now, or do you want to together? Okay, okay, because uh, uh, there'll be more questions coming in, I think. So Sneha, uh, you go next, and then after Sneha, Manush, Manushda will ask a question. So uh, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Where yes. are you? Can we see you? No, we can't see you, but we can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, so I then. wanted to, uh, um, like, I wanted to ask basically, like, the new wave, the moment of the new wave is very anachronistic. Like it starts and stops and it starts and stops. So I want, I, and I assume that your book will answer my question, but I don't have it right now. But where do you place Ojantrik in this uh, setting? Because that is a very uh, offbeat film, as uh, Shwetajit Rai would say. So that's my question. Manushta? Well, <clears throat> can you see me or that's not important? No, we can't see you. We can hear you though. If you switch on, really? we'll be able to see you. Uh, well, I don't know what to switch on, but anyway, let me ask. Okay, ask your question. Yeah, see, I'm just, uh, you know, uh, Bhuvan Shom is my most favorite uh, Rinal Shen, you know, and I watch it uh, from time to time. I have one uh, curiosity, if you could give me a lead of how to solve it, is that Bhuvan Shom was not only an experimental film, you know, far more than other films of its time, but it was also a mega box office hit. Perhaps the most uh, uh, commercially successful Mrinal Shen, you know, film. Now, what I wonder is, after making Wuhan Shum, if I'm not wrong in 69 or 68, you know, the films he started making was so much different from Wuhan Shum. You know, they became typical you know, agitational films full of, um, what to say, noise and, you know, slogans and that sort of thing. And I have a tentative answer to this kind of paradox, if you would like. And that is Mrinal Shen was never fascinated by the charm of the visual. Why do I say that? You know, remember Bhubun Shum was a film you know, uh, uh, cinematographed by K.K. Mahajan. And he is one of the most wonderful cinematographers of Indian film history. And remember also the location of Bhuvan Show, you know. So that gave ample kind of scope for the visual kind of flourish that we see. But then if you look at Renal Shen's other films, He's mostly into telling a tightly knit plot with interruptions. Keep on interrupting an otherwise tightly knit plot. So, I mean, I don't know how far I'm you know, correct, so I would like your opinion. And the second and last point is, you know, you mentioned uh, in detail Ray's, you know, opposition to um, the new kind of new Indian cinema, which as it is, you know, is a problematic category because to have Basu Chatterjee and Rinal Shen, and then on the other side to have Kumar Sahani and uh, others, or, uh, you know, uh, Manikal, you know, and that strange kind of alchemy of Ghatak and Bresson that they managed to do you know, which you know, is beyond me, so I, I don't want to comment on that. But it, it itself is a very uh, complex kind of brew. But then, I mean, if Ray's comments had hurt the new parallel cinema of the kind Basu Chatterjee and Mrinal Sen did, what would you think of the new kind of film studies that came from the 80s, largely influenced by cultural studies, and their denigration, not only of Ray's realism, but also of films that Mrinalsen or others produced, you know. So, and their kind of, what, uh, panegyrics of the Indian popular cinema, uh, the Bollywood, so to say, as the people's, you know, people's cinema. Did that hurt 
this new kind of experiments that were going on in Indian cinema at that point of time. Thank you. Go ahead, Rochana. I think that's quite yes, a lot. I think that was a, a bunch of questions. So maybe I'm just going to mix up the order and maybe also bring some of the questions together. So when I, you know, when I titled my talk as the New Indian Cinema Journey of the Art Film, there was a gesture there, which is that uh, I'm, I'm actually seeing the new cinema as a continuation of the break that we saw in the 1950s, you know, beginning with uh, Nimai Ghosh's Chinnamul, other experiments, say Nicha Nagar uh, by Chetan Anand and people, and then of course, Shrotajit Rai's Othil uh, Pachali. Uh, and this is actually going back to the lovely question you had, uh, Sneha, which is to say that uh, in, in, if when, you, when you see it as, as part of one long story of, of, uh, of Indian art cinema, you actually see that, uh, you know, Pothir Pachali and Ojantrik, uh, Bharati Kepalye, Baishis Rabon, they are all part of a tremendous, uh, a tremendous break. You know, it's not this, this Pothir Pachali perhaps acquired the most international fame, but uh, the fact that this was a, a scene where, where there was a lot going on and it couldn't, and I think that these people were, were learning from each other, arguing with each other, teaching one another. I think that that is not to be underestimated at all. So I'm completely, uh, you know, I'm with you that, um, what, I mean, so many of these films actually didn't get commercial releases, you know, like, uh, Shani and Gaul's films didn't get commercial releases. Shubhana Rekha, as you know, was finished in 1962, didn't release until 65. Uh, Nagorik, I think it showed in a cinema hall in Howrah for very briefly and then not until uh, Ghatuk's death. And uh, somebody I think said that, um, I think Moedu Liu said that uh, that you thought of uh, Pothir Pachali and so on as instances of unpopular cinema. Actually, they were not unpopular at all. You know, Shwetajit Rai himself, in an interview, he actually says that, um, and he's not wrong. I mean, you can check the figures. They did very well in the box office in West Bengal. They did extremely well. Uh, Meghita Katara did phenomenally well. I mean, it was one of one of the few of Ghatok's films that did well, but it did extremely well. So. It wasn't, I mean, you know, this question of popular and unpopular, one has to ask like which audience you're, talk, you're referring to. Now, obviously it wasn't like a diwar. It didn't succeed on that scale. And one of the things that Shotajit Rai says in one interview is that uh, even at the height of my fame, my films were only shown in Sunday morning shows in, um, in cinema theaters in other states of West Bengal. The only exception actually was Bangalore, where it did show, uh, where it, it did have uh, commercial screenings. Now, then, you know, so, so I want to take this, this, this question of uh, autocritique and, and, and perhaps maybe uh, Manoshta's question together with it. Look, one of the points that I, I make in the book and I, um, what I see is that art cinema was born at the moment that India became independent and it, it actually shared in the Indian state's vision to produce good citizens. So at the beginning, so if you take the 1950s to be uh, the, the beginning, it's almost like art cinema, cinema shares the journey of the new Indian state to produce a good citizenry. So in other words, a good film, which is oftentimes how people talked about the art cinema, a good film and good citizen making went together. From the 60s, what you see is certainly in the part uh, of, of, of the, these three filmmakers, Rai Ghatok and Shen, to an extent certain others as well. 
what you see is a complete divestment from this uh, shared project, if you will, with the state. And what good films then become is, you know, it's, it, I, I mean, that's when you find that there's a complete disillusionment with the project of development, with the project that, that there's a dis destinal narrative of the state and we're all walking this walk together into, you know, just an investment, like, I mean, to, to, to put it very reductively, it's just about making good films. But really what is going on there is, is something very radical. I mean, in Indian history, you have critiques of whatever the, you know, the transition to modernity debates and so on, well into the early, or it, it takes place sometime around the early 80s with, with Ranajit Kuhol, the Subaltern Studies Collective, later on then with feminist histories, caste histories and so on. The argument I make in the book is that Indian art cinema anticipates historians by at least 25 years. So in, in a sense, their critiques of development, and not everyone is making the critique in exactly the same way. Rai makes it in a certain way, Khotrok makes it in a certain way, uh, Minashin does it in a certain way. In some ways, you have to think about them as historians who are working with the medium of cinema. And what I'm interested in is not so much who's right or who's wrong, whose description of the Indian, uh, of the post-colonial Indian state is more accurate or less accurate. What, uh, what interests me is the different, different apprehensions that they have of the post-colonial Indian present. Apprehensions that we see reflected in Indian historiography in which I came of age, you know, which developed from say the late 80s well into the 90s. And uh, my interest is in asking, well, what is it that actually enabled these filmmakers to, do, to undertake such a critique well before it happens in, in, in history or any of the other social sciences in, in India? And I have, you know, I won't go into it at great length, but I mean, uh, what you see is that they, they have, uh, they offer other histories, if you will, of uh, the democratic experiment in India, which is, you know, which does not, which doesn't have to be the progressive historicist uh, narrative that was, that, that was popular in the 40s, 50s, well into the 60s and early 70s, if you will, in, the, in, in history, in, uh, in the disciplines. If, uh, so in that sense, I think there was a, the films were, um, or at least that's my claim anyway, that films anticipate um, by, like I said, you know, good three decades uh, academic work. Now, to Manushta's questions, I'm not sure what, I mean, you know, again, I think these films, and this is one of, this is one of the things I wanted to indicate at the end of my talk, I think these films make us, it's very hard, let's say, to come up with positive definitions of, well, this is what Bhuvan Shom did. Uh, you're right in that it, it marks a break in uh, Miral Shain's program. But he's, you know, he's, he's a filmmaker who's constantly reinventing himself. I mean, he makes a film like Akash Kushom just a few years before Bhuvan Shom gets completely canned. You know, that's the film, if you remember, that uh, Shotarit Rai described as uh, uh, Crow film. Then, you know, this, this interview, uh, just after this, I mean, he makes the trilogy interview, uh, Calcutta 71 and Podatik. And actually, in a film like Podatik, you find that he's completely going back again on what he had done in Interview and, uh, and uh, Calcutta 71. So, I'm, I mean, I'm, I partly agree with you that, yeah, he's not a visually, um, in one sense, he's not visually super experimental. In another sense, I think he's tremendously experimental. He has the style of a political pamphleteer. He brings, I mean, you know, the way he does... Uh, he's most taken with, you know, with, with certain formal devices, I mean, whether it's the freeze, whether it's montage, uh, whether it's a, a certain documentary agitprop style. Now, what are those if they're not, you know, visual, visual experimentation? So, 
I think this could be an ongoing conversation. So for, but perhaps um, I'll stop there and just see if there are other questions. Is that what you meant when you spoke about radical democratic possibility? No, I, what I meant by radical democratic possibility is actually trying to think through um, So one of the one of the criticisms that I think some uh, that were made, I think Manush was indicating this, of one of the criticisms that were made of Indian art cinema was that oh it claimed to be for the people but people didn't watch it. Now, there's obviously a debate, uh, or this this that intimates that at the heart of Indian arts art cinema is this question of well what constitutes the people. So when I said radical democratic possibilities, what I meant is these films are ultimately a cogitation on how to think about uh, this, the concept of the Indian people, where it has come from and where it might be going. And, uh, you know, I, the provisional title of my book is Forgotten Futures, Indian Art Cinema in Postcolonial India, or post, uh, Art Cinema in Postcolonial India. And what I mean by forgotten futures is actually going back to the post-colonial present that these films inhabited to remind us of the futures that were foreclosed by the failure of the art cinema project. And that is the, the you know, that is the engine of radical democratic possibility that I ended my talk with, where I said that these films actually were, they had certain imaginations of what, uh, what a democratic notion of the people might have looked like in in the post-colonial setting so um that's no okay. thanks yeah yeah um are there any other questions there are a lot of people who are very well qualified to ask and who might want to um is there anybody else who would like to ask a question Either of the Rajoshis, Umadi. <laughs> okay. I don't have anything. I can't see anything on, on chat. If you do have a question, just raise your, I mean, don't even need to raise a hand. Just unmute yourself and speak and, uh, you know, we'll be able to hear you. Um, No, no further questions. Ma'am Shinka, this yes. is yes. I just thank uh, Rachana for a very interesting uh, chapter on the great directors and the comparison that she made over here. Uh, rarely do we hear people talking about it. And she did a very scholarly treatment of the three or four directors so I wanted to thank her profusely for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Rajana. Well, that's my job half done. <laughs> but but uh, uh, if you're quite sure that nobody else... Oh, there you are, Rajushi. Yes, I was thinking this Rajushi and the other Rajushi as well who, uh, who uh, once presented a paper on Ajantrik in a conference entitled The Long 1950s. I thought he might want to say something. Upal is here as well. But yeah, go ahead, uh, Rajushi. Please. Okay, Rochadi, thank you very much. Uh, so I was uh, really, you know, I have um, two questions. One is, of course, the longer one, which I, uh, which you have already responded to. How uh, you argue that uh, the new Indian cinema anticipated a lot of uh, critiques of Indian democracy, Indian politics that uh, were articulated through. Uh, historiography of the 1990s, uh, but you have already responded to it, and I would rather wait for your book <laughs> to for the uh, longer response. But I was really, you know, uh, uh, all, uh, also in course of this talk, as well as in a lot of the scholarship of on Indian cinema at large, uh, it has been often. Com uh, commented that across regions, Indian cinema tends to be very wordy, right? So if we, if we look, you know, and uh, by being wordy, wordy, they draw on older uh, literary traditions, older, 
predictions of performance. And uh, so when you were talking about how Bernard Shen uh, stands out as the director from amongst this trio, who often moves out, who often you know, adventures into other, other linguistic traditions, other linguistics regions to uh, test out his craft of the new Indian cinema, which uh, Shotit Wright does um, sometimes and uh, in Sadgati or in Satrantri Kilari. But I'm not aware of Riti Ghotuk doing it. Uh, for, forgive my ignorance. So what happens when uh, you know, and, and, and especially in the case of Mrinal Shen, Mrinal Shen makes uh, a cinema in languages that he does not uh, formally follow in the, in the, in, in, in the pure ling uh, linguistic sense, right? So, so, what, uh, so, what, so what happens when you make, uh, so when you move out of your own linguistic comfort zones, I would say Hindi, by the time Satyajit Rai was making Sadgati or Satranshi Khilari, he must have been quite conversant with the, uh, 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 with, with the linguistic uh, uh, politics of Hindi slash Urdu. But Mrinanshin actually moves on to make uh, movies in languages that he does not understand. Right, in terms of its linguistic purpose. So what happens then? So in Indian cinema being so invested in, in, in its older literary heritage, in its older performative uh, tra uh, traditions. And here is, you have a director who test outs his craft in a linguistic zone that is, uh, he is alien to. Rajeshi, it's very good to see you. And I caught a glimpse of Bahar I wish I could actually see her once one more time. But, uh, and I think it's a characteristically thoughtful and uh, great question. And I'm actually, I'm just really gladdened that my heart is gladdened that, that you asked this because, um, you know, again, you, I mean, you, you put it, you said Indian cinema is very wordy. Now, again, I'm kind of curious to hear whether it's any more wordy than, say, classical Hollywood cinema. You know, because when we remember great dialogues, uh, it's it's really the words that we remember, right? I mean, you know, one of my favorite, I think it's almost like a credo sometimes I live by, is Lambi Reis Kaghora from Divar. You know, it's, it's just something... It's such a fabulous piece of dialogue. I mean, and, and I think that there are other cinematic traditions uh, which are, to, you know, to quote you, to quote you, are as wordy. Now, what you're pointing to is something very interesting. Now, I noticed this, say, in the scholarship on Riti Ghotok. There's a, there's a remarkable, um, there's a remarkable essay on Riti Ghotok by a French scholar called Raymond Balour. And Bhaskar Shorkar actually then writes about Raymond Balu writing about uh, Ghotok, and he says that even to people who don't follow Bangla, uh, it doesn't matter um, because his his camera work is so stupendous. And they're talking actually about you know certain sequences in in Meghita Katara. And when I first read that, I thought, wait a minute, you know. A, a sequence, say, where you have a song like Jirate Muddu Arguli playing, and the poignance of the sister saying to the brother, you know, the pain of that, how can one fully get to it without understanding the, like, what's entailed in the words? So I think, I, you know, I'm walking with you that like in, in I think we're fellow travelers when I when when I think we say that it's incredibly important to understand the words I mean and in Hindi cinema as you know there are particularly in the post partition period there are so many poets and uh, composers who've come in I mean so so yes words play a very important role now your question about what does Mrinal Shen in a sense you're asking what does he lose when he's making Okauri Kotha or uh, Mrigoya. 
and this goes back in some ways to <clears throat> Manushna and uh, Muldu's questions, I think. We're talking about many different artists here whose relationship to, to language is also very, very different. You know, Riti Ghatok, for example, says, Jay, um, he's actually arguing with people who think of Tagore as a romantic. And he says that this man has said whatever I had to say before I was born. I mean, in a sense, he's actually claiming to be in, you know, there's, there's something about that before I was born, right? And going back to radical democratic possibilities, he's, he's fellow travelers with Tagore, a man who he didn't, he didn't see. Mrinal Shin, he takes on a different inheritance of Bengali history. He actually writes at one point that we have to rewrite the history of India as a history of a long famine and a history that arises from the hunger that comes out of that famine, that's where political anger has its birth. So he has a different kind of genealogy, literary and otherwise, that he claims for himself. So in, in, in some of, you know, when people respond, people have crit very critical responses to Mrigoya and to Okauli Katha, and he, you know, I, I don't think that his investment in the literary was quite the same as say, uh, as, as Rai's would have been or Khotuk's would have been. In Shatranj Ke Khilari, again, I don't think that it's, it's, it's literary investment is quite the same say as, as what you see in Charulata. You know, it's a, it's a different kind of, I mean, he does a lot of meticulous historical work, but the kind of wordplay that you see, you know, with Charu singing, bonkim, bonkim, like, or remember those those little bits now. So I think, again, I, or I would submit to you that we think about people's relationship to literature and their literary inheritance in a dynamic way. And I mean, for me, Riti Ghatok is actually the one who's the most literary. I mean, and there too, I mean, I'll say this and shut up. He, he's unique. In, in let's say in this group of people, Rai Ghatokshin, but he's also a fellow traveler with somebody like uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini who propounds something called a cinema of poetry. And I think that that's what Ghatok is doing. He's actually doing a cinema of poetry. So I think there are different filmmakers who calibrate their relationship to certain inheritances uh, from the other arts and and you know, take the horizons of cinema in 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 or or chart the horizons of cinema differently. So that's that would be my my provisional response for now. But it's a lovely, lovely question. Thank you, thank you, Rochadi. Rochadi, when I said that uh, uh, that Indian cinema is supposed to be worthy, I didn't mean it in a you know pre prejudiced manner. No, no, I, I know you. Had, you're yeah, I just said that you know yeah. more Japanese cinema and French c c c cinema. Like both France and Japan having so so much of celebrated and nurtured literary traditions, but their literary traditions don't so much play on their cinema. You know, there's a certain degree of uh, independence that cinema as an art comes to uh, exhibit vis-a-vis -vis those literary influences in, say, France or Japan. Yeah, so Arushi, I, think, really I think we would have to. I think that this is subject of a much longer conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Much a conversation because again, true, there are articles written, say around the same, around the time that these, uh, say, Chodhuritra is starting the Calcutta Film Society. I mean, you know, Alexander Rostruk writes the camera stilo. Uh, people are talking about uh, um, uh, basically Truffaut and people, you know, they're talking about a certain tendency in French film where they're decrying what they see as the literary influence. But my God, I mean, there is, there is a huge amount of literature that actually talks about what kind of literature they are decrying and what kind of literature they are promoting. So, you know, it's a certain modernist sensibility where Godard and Truffaut and these people are actually drawing on a certain tradition of pulp. So it's, it depends on what is being redefined right. as as the literary High literature and pulp, yeah. And so, so, and you have to see film as a player in this minefield of all the other arts. I don't know so much about the new Japanese context, but I'd be very surprised 
uh, if it's talking about that kind of media specificity. Because I think, you know, all of these people have a certain investment in, in media specificity, but they're also deeply into media. Okay. Thank you so much, Roshwadi. Thank you. Rochana, Upal has a question. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, sort of, uh, I know we are sort of, uh, we are okay Rajushi with time. Das Rajushi Das well. Rajushita? Okay, he, uh, yeah. Oh, where did he, did he say that in chat? Oh, I'm sorry, Rajushi. I, yeah, my, uh, I, had the I didn't see it uh, on my screen. So Rajushi, Rajushi, Rajushi first, the first and then Upal. Yeah. Rajushi, Rajushi probably has an observation to the other Rajushi about the literary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So the other Rajushi uh, uh, can, can uh, ask and then, and then Upal. Okay, sure. So am I audible? Yes. Open that? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Rochana, for this very fascinating presentation. And this is very exciting to know that uh, your book is going to come out talking about these three directors and this new cinema. Fingers I was crossed. wondering, and this is, yeah, sorry. No, no, I just said fingers crossed. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I was wondering, and this is uh, a bit awkward, but it's meant to kind of be provocative, uh -huh. that I was uh, thinking about, uh, in a very schematic manner, the relationship between visual dialogues and music in these three directors. And it seems to me, I mean, this is perhaps a little naive of me, but it seems to me that both Riptik and Shottajit managed to work out radically new kind of relationships between these three elements, largely. Mm -hmm. And to my mind, you know, again, uh, uh, it may be a limitation on my part, Mrinal uh, actually does not work it out to that great an extent as the mm -hmm. other two. That's how I feel about it. The only I, exception, yeah, sorry, should I no, carry I, on? No, no, please, yeah, I was just expressing my agreement, yeah. The, the only exception, I think, is actually Bhuvan Shom and mm. the sequence that you are showing, because that's one sequence where I think perhaps it's one of the rare kind of sequences where Mrinal is coming very close to representing a feeling and affect of what it is to feel a feeling and which is not becoming, you know, underwritten with a whole lot of dialogues and commentary and, you know, that sort of a thing. So, and this is another Mrinal, not the one that is, you know, that you, as Manushta was saying, that, that we are more familiar with that Mrinal who's far more angry and who's, you know, uh, being within quotes, very strongly political in a way. Mm. So that, that's one sort of, I wanted to know your reaction about that. The other thing was, is this, that although the, I suppose the people who, love and watch these three directors' works are mostly from uh, middle class and educated middle class. I would like to imagine that there is a way in which Shottajit and Ritik are trying their best to make their films accessible to a wider kind of public. They're trying to create and constitute a film watching public. Mm -hmm. But Mrinal, in some sense, I find him very much uh, restricting himself to a certain kind of high modernist middle class spectatorship because of the formal conventions that he you know insists on using so yeah so those are just kind of two you know observations and i was wondering what would be your reaction to them you know since since time is short i'll respond briefly although the, these questions actually merit I, I, we could we could talk all day long and I hope that there will be opportunity for a face-to-face -face conversation where this can you know continue into a post-talk discussion. See that we have subjective responses to how we look upon the work of these directors is not surprising that's what you do with people who are generative. Now that said the distinction you were making between soundtrack versus music that's very, very important, no doubt. But I, I personally, I mean, since we're talking about subjective things here, I personally find Renal Chen to be 
you're quite radical and experimental. So to, to speak with one concrete example, if you take Podatik, which by the way is not an angry film, you know, where it ends, it actually, it ends with the dissolving of a certain kind of political anger, which he becomes very critical of. It ends with that scene of Dhritivan and Bijan Hochaj, you know, of the father-son coming together. Father is an old uh, trade unionist and the son was a, a Nokshal. And it actually comes together. It's a meeting of generations. Now, if you take uh, a film like Podatik and that remarkable sequence where um, uh, he's writing this letter to the party elder, talking about the importance of, uh, of criticizing what the party does. And, you know, presumably he's talking about the ML. Now that scene is actually intercut with an interview that Simi Garewal, that, that character, Sheila, Sheila Mitro, is undertaking with some women. Now, if you, if you, if you think of the, the intercalation of, that, of that, that sequence, of the soundtrack and the, and the visuals, I think it's actually a remarkable sequence because you go back and forth between one man's reverie and uh, this interview in which actually Shujitra Mitra appears uh, briefly talking about what independence has made, meant for Indian women. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's a very experimental soundtrack. It may not have music, but it's, it produces the sonic ambience of, of the film and you know, it provokes a certain kind of thinking. Now, I, I think I, I agree with you uh, that he doesn't have the same kind of musical uh, flourish that not just uh, uh, Shotajit and uh, Ritik have, but you know, later on people like, uh, you know, Khayal Gatha and I mean, so, so the avant-garde actually have, and, and he's quite ad ad admiring of. Going back to this theme of whether they were wanting whether they all wanted big audiences and were actively working towards securing big audiences. I think, you know, that's something that we can continue to reason, debate and argument about. Because as a historian, when you go to their written corpus, I think each one, you know, whether it's rows and rows of fences or whether if you look at, uh, you know, different things by, by different things that all of these directors have written, nobody wanted to, nobody wanted to play to the empty galleries. You know, in that sense, they were not critical of, say, the category of communication in the way that Manikal was. Manikal has that very important essay called Communication. Shotoji, Trithik, Mrinal, they were, they actually did not uh, undercut the value of what Manikal once derided as communication. And I think that's why they emerge as such pedagogues in the history of Indian art cinema. I mean, I, I take your questions as, you know, they are very generative and I think we can, like I said, we can keep arguing and debating about them, but that's, for now, that would be my humble submission that I wouldn't want to box them into these uh, compartments because, you know, the tendency, I think, in Indian film history is to see them as each other's counterpoints. I see them as counterparts. Paul? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Hello, Rochanadi. Thank you. Very interesting uh, presentation. I will not be able to comment much on the context of the film conversation or the uh, analysis of uh, the specific uh, moments from the film and the films that you were referring to. I, ha I had a question about, uh, it's more of a uh, history of ideas kind of question into this uh, whole presentation that you have made uh, in the sense that, as in you, you are obviously aware of uh, this uh, old versus new thing that uh, goes on in uh, canon making and tradition making. And historian of, historians of ideas, they often enter these conversations uh -huh. to make sense of the claims of old and new and analyze them, maybe not in terms of 
in those terms in which participants of those conversation are making these distinctions, but in a different set of terms. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering that <clears throat> the way in which you enter this conversation, um, mm, on the question of newness, uh, while referring, while responding to Manos, that you were saying that it's difficult to really positively put down the newness in particular definite terms. You have you have said that on the question of newness. During your presentation, you have also said that you know newness is perhaps to be interpreted can be interpreted as a kind of samulakram, while you know uh, uh, using uh, Deepesh Chakraborty's reading of the illusion of particular context. And you've also said that, you know, maybe newness is in this, that it, in, in Renal Shen, newness is this, is in this, that it can be uh, continuously reinterpreted <clears throat> with reference to this particular film also. So I was thinking that, it, that you choose to stick to, uh, to uh, the category new, mm -hmm. the reason for that, in the sense that, often we see that there is an analysis of the old new distinction from a movement away from this distinction and shifting the debate to let's say other terms which uh -huh. which do not repeat or reproduce the old new distinction while you seem to be not invested in the same terms in which the old new distinction is being carried out either in the ray conversation or later in the 80s film criticism conversation but at the same time you do seem to also stick to a claim of calling it new so uh, <clears throat> this is something i'm trying to understand that what would be your explanation for this move analytical move so, look i mean i think i think you're actually upal you're asking a, a rich question and i don't want to I don't want to give it, I don't want to sound glib, uh, but in a way, when I, when I say the new Indian cinema, you know, I'm doing basically what a historian would do, uh, reproduce what, what players then uh, said about their own self-description. So, you know, there is this manifesto that uh, Minal Shen and, and Arun Kaul wrote where they defined the new, uh, the Indian, the new Indian cinema. So in a sense, I'm actually just being, showing my fidelity to that archive. But then I'm also doing another thing that a historian does, which is to interrogate what uh, that, inter interrogate what the archive is, is, is telling us. And perhaps, you know, one thing that, Maybe, I mean, and maybe that would be a good place to end this talk. See, again, uh, art cinema, the category doesn't hold anymore. At least in the Indian context, it doesn't hold anymore. Even though we don't have art houses, you know, we don't have an art house film uh, circuit in quite the same way that, say, a lot of other places in the world do that this art versus popular or art versus commercial divide is not as resonant as it used to be in the era of development. I think, you know, post-globalization, it's sort of all merged one into the other. Multiplexes are supposed to cater to all kinds of, of film tastes. So the question then becomes, well, what is the investment in going back to this, this body of films? And, and I think the investment is actually thinking to, to go back to this, you know, to this question of the breaks that are suggested by the new and to find in those breaks or to ask if in those breaks we can find any resources for our present. And I think that the answer to that, I mean, you know, at least my answer to that is yes. And that's why, I mean, to, to me, the debate about the new is as old as you know, you can, like I said, you can go back to say Rajiv Kinra's discussion of Tazagul. But then each time that that debate plays out in whichever media it's playing out in, whether it's, you know, a particular kind of literature or it's uh, a particular kind of painting or film or whatever, there is something that is also in surplus of 
whichever older debate in which uh, in which tradition these people were trying to uh, which tradition that these people were trying to either claim or reclaim or discard for their purposes so i think in a lot of ways the expression new is saturated with political energies and my interest is in both understanding those political energies and then taking another step to ask whether those political energies have any salience for us in thinking about the the gridlock that let's say we find ourselves in in our contemporary times and i think that that's and this goes back to somebody asked about rosinka asked about topon shimo you know i think i mean who we find generative uh in in our times i think it goes back to how we like we all make this is ultimately ultim about canon making you know these people were making canons shrotujitra like all the film society people they were making different kinds of canons people who followed them in the 1980s were displacing their canons and putting together another kind of canon i think now we are engaged if not so much i mean you know, nobody says we're making canons anymore but we go back to this earlier body of work to ask not just what they meant in their times but also to ask this question of well what does it mean in our times and i think that one of the things about the category new is the other constant set of meanings to which they lend themselves so there are things that i see today in mrinal shen which mrinal shen may not necessarily have seen or or may not have respond i mean you know may not have thought about in quite the same way i mean very quickly so for example if you if you see some of the you know the famine photo ranu's here like she she knows that he uses some he's very influenced by by chitu prashad by abidin all these people and when i see it you know i actually i i read it as a kind of human animal encounter i see it as a as a grappling if you, if you will with you know what people now call the era of the anthropocene and there are film scholars this is a beautiful book called inhospitable world by jennifer fay that does this kind of a reading with the american film noir so now obviously people who were watching american film noir in the 1950s didn't watch it like that we do today so in other words we are actually imbuing the new with a the new becomes a placeholder in which we put a whole constellation of meanings that actually have relevance for our times and that's what then goes back to the eh card dictum of history being this constant dialogue between the past and the present you know because we bring our particular understanding of the present to bear on which archives we excavate which archives we consider worthy of reading and it's in that tension that the expression new acquires a certain charge i mean that may be a so, you know the it's an inexact response to your question but that's that's how i would or i want to or i have been thinking about it thank you thank you well that's a wonderful thought on which to end uh, today unless there are any further questions there are none in chat um are there any further questions today i don't want to deny anybody the opportunity to ask because that that really goes against my grain as well as the grain of the center we we would uh, normally when we become completely helpless and the room needs to be closed in a physical seminar we then say okay let's take it to the canteen <laughs> we can't do that today we can't take it to the canteen um but uh, it doesn't look as if nobody else has actually indicated that they need uh, need to ask a question very urgently right now i'm sure you may get contacted by people who have further questions i don't know rochna but i thought that was that was that was really a very relevant note on which to end and and something that i couldn't agree more with you on that uh, it is what what our present makes of 
the past uh, achievements or the past corpus or the past uh, uh, contexts of history um, that that makes uh, anything relevant in any any sort of work actually i won't even qualify it by saying scholarly work or academic work anybody who think seriously uh, think seriously in the context of where they are today uh, and, uh, whatever your material, so to speak, may be, uh, you know, in that sense. So thank you for a, for a wonderful uh, uh, sort of evening with you. For us over here, it's evening. <laughs> and and uh, 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 the talk itself, but uh, also the discussion that followed, okay. you know, this is, yeah. Was that, did I hear anybody? No. Did you hear anybody, Ruchana? Was there anybody who, no, maybe it was just somebody's, uh, I think it's people now getting restless. So. <laughs> so thank you. I'll let you go as well. Thank you very much. I hope we can do this again sometime. If not virtually, then in person. And we look forward to your book very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank bye you. Bye. I'll end the meeting then. Thank you. Bye. Bye.